Hi everyone, Steve here. Let's take a quick look at this post that showed up on my Facebook feed this morning. This is a photo of a computer program from Ron Bumblefoot Thal, an accomplished musician who was recently part of Guns N' Roses. He writes, Just found this! Ha! A computer program I wrote as a teen in the mid-80s to make strange music scales. Anyone still have a Commodore 64 that wants to try this? Well, I couldn't resist trying to decipher this, and I found it really fascinating that it is a handwritten copy of a computer program, not a program that was saved on disk or printed in a magazine for that matter. And when we look at this program, there's all sorts of notation shortcuts, including the ones that are common to the Commodore's basic language. For example, in the first two or three lines, we can see that the shortcut for poke is used, the P and shifted O, there is a heart and an E inside of a quotation, which is usually meant to clear the screen and probably change the color to white. I think that's what was intended there. The abbreviation for read is used, R shift E, the abbreviation for next is used, N shift E, and so on. It basically goes on through the whole program. And then later on, around line 35, we see that there are some parentheses to the right of the page. And what that means is that he's going to reduplicate that line, but assign it a different line number. So line 35 is copied later on as line 49, line 36 is copied as line 48, etc., all the way to line 41, which is copied as line 43. And we'll see what that does in a moment. There are also some syntax errors in this transcription most notably the missing poke statements on line 12 and some missing colons near the bottom of the program on line 99 and the ones that follow. But let's not fault Bumblefoot here. After all, this was written over 30 years ago and we don't know if he had a way to save computer programs on his Commodore 64. He probably just copied it from the screen because he didn't have a disk drive or cassette drive or a printer that could have printed it out. Anyhow, I've typed in this program, fixed the syntax errors, and I've saved it to my GitHub page in case anybody wants to explore it on their own. Link to that in the description. So without further ado, let's get this thing running on an emulator and see what happens. You can hear that an arpeggio was played. If I press a key on the keyboard, a similar arpeggio is played. Now listen carefully while I cycle through this a couple times. You might not hear it, but what's happening is a slightly different arpeggio is played every time we cycle through this user input. And that's effectively what this program will do. It will play several arpeggios, slightly modified every single time, until it gets to the end of its loops and it starts all over again. So let's take a look at the source code and see how this works. I had to learn some SID programming today to fully understand what's happening, and maybe I'll be able to convey that to you in a concise manner. Okay, so basically the first line of code initializes the screen color and sets the text to lowercase, and the second and third line of code on the screen are effectively loading note information into a bunch of arrays. And the note information is stored on the last few lines of the program, which basically looks like that. Each note that this program plays on the SID chip is represented with two bytes. We start on line 1000, and the first note is represented by bytes with values 16 and 195. The second note is represented by the values 17 and 195, and so on, all the way through to the end of line 1001, where we have the final note that's represented by bytes 33 and 135. There are 13 notes total and 26 bytes altogether. Line 1002 contains the 13 text labels that are presented on the screen each time one of the arpeggios is played. I don't know what these text labels represent, but presumably they mean something to Bumblefoot or musicians in general. Okay. So let's take a look at how the notes are actually played. 
So this is half of the arpeggio that's played. And as I noted earlier, the other half is basically the reverse of these statements. It continues from line 43 to lines 49 in the program. Now this might look a little crazy, especially when you see it written on a piece of paper, but there's a pattern that's followed through here, and the end result of that pattern is quite easy to understand. So let's start with the first line, and we'll see that the first thing we do is we write a value to a particular memory address, which I'll explain in a moment, and it's going to be the first byte of the first note that's played. And then we write a value to a second memory address, and that's going to be the second byte of the first note that's played. And then following some print statements on the screen and some formatting of some text, we print the value from those text labels that showed up in the last data statement. The value of S is initialized at the beginning of the program to the memory location of the SID chip, and it's address D400, if I remember correctly. So the first byte is written to D401, and the second byte is written to D400. And basically, this continues for all the notes in this block of code. We're just modifying the notes ever so slightly, depending on the loop indexes that are executing this code. And the loop indexes are basically the following. So as we execute that block of arpeggio code through these loops, the notes are ever so slightly changed. We either add a value of zero to the note, which doesn't change it at all, or we add a value of one to it, which changes it just a little bit. Finally, there's a little block of code here that waits for user input before playing the next arpeggio. And there are also some subroutines that control the amount of time that a note is played before we go to the next note that has to be played. And that's basically it. Now you'll notice that there's a problem on line 100. And I wasn't able to resolve this because I really didn't know what was the intention. It says go sub 501, but there isn't a 501 line number. So when the program runs to its completion, it will eventually crash on this line. Line 25 is basically the first loop in the beginning of that stack of loops. So it will effectively have replayed the arpeggios after line 501 was executed. But unfortunately, we don't know what that was supposed to do. Now, one thing I'm interested in is hearing all the arpeggios that this program can produce. But I don't want to keep mashing the keys and listening to them one at a time. So what I'm going to do next is I'll modify this ever so slightly to remove the weight for the user input and also remove the delays that control the length of time a note is played. And then I'll run the program and we can see what happens. So to do that, we can remove line 51, which controls the weight for the user input. And then on lines 500 and 502, we can simply change that to return, which will effectively exit the subroutine right away without doing anything useful. And we'll do the same thing for 502. So let's run the program and see what happens now. Okay, and there's the crash I was alluding to earlier on due to the missing line number 501. And the poke that I entered basically silenced the SID chip for the particular channel that was being used to generate the note while the program has crashed. Okay, so I've reloaded the program because I have a small confession I have to make, and you've probably noticed that while you were looking at the program listing. And that confession is that the program that I just demonstrated is not exactly the same as what Bumblefoot transcribed on his notes. And the reason is because I added some statements that turn the SID on and off after the user input has been requested and then processed. And you can see that on line 50, where we turn off the active uh, note or the active uh, noise that's being made, and then we turn it back on to what it was originally initialized to uh, once the user has um, press the key on the keyboard. And the reason I did this is because nowhere in the program does the SID actually get turned off. So when we're waiting for user input, the last played note continues to play indefinitely. And when the program stops, 
the last played note continues to play indefinitely until you power cycle the machine or press stop restore and reset uh, things that way. Now, I thought this might have happened because of a transcription error on my part. Just like in the good old days of typing programs from Compute's Gazette, you enter 100 lines, something doesn't work as expected, and you have to go read 100 lines of printed notes to figure out where your problem is. But I don't think that's the case. That said, I'm at my limits of understanding how the SID gets programmed, and so I can't quite figure out why this is a problem. It could just have been a problem from the very beginning. I just don't know. So to quote Lucius Fox, a better mind is needed to solve this problem. And I'm gonna cast out the bat signal and ask Robin, if you're listening, perhaps you can help us fix the autopilot on the bat wing or the audio resonance module or something like that. Maybe you or the community can help us explain what's really happening here. And to give a demonstration of how this thing was supposed to work, let me remove the code that I've added earlier and we'll see what happens. I'll take that away and let's take this last one away. And that's it. So this was quite an adventure for me in SID programming today. And I want to thank Bumblefoot for posting this piece of programming from his past and sharing it with the community. It certainly helped me learn something about the SID chip. And I hope it helps you learn something too. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this presentation informative. And I hope to see you back soon.